Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Intro to Elixir tutorial series. In today's video, we're going to expand upon the concepts of pattern matching that we talked about in the last video. And we're going to talk about some of the constructs and concepts that Elixir gives us to basically harness these ideas and make them a lot more powerful. So in the last video, we saw that we could split functions into multiple different clauses, effectively creating multi-clause functions. This can be fairly complicated, especially when dealing with different types. And because Elixir is not a statically typed language, we need some way of restricting the types and just the general forms that are being passed into a function. This is where we get a idea which is called guards. So let's say for instance, we want to write a function that accepts a number and then returns an atom uh, and the atom will tell us whether or not the number is negative, zero, or positive, depending on the number's value. This isn't really possible with the simple pattern matching that we've gone over thus far, so we have these guards which we can use instead. And guards are an extension of the basic pattern matching mechanism that we looked at, and they allow you to state an additional broader expectation that must be satisfied for the entire pattern to match. So here we have a three clause function where two of the clauses are using guards. The part here where we specify when for the argument X is the actual guard that we're attaching to the clause. For this clause and for this clause, the fundamental function pattern is exactly the same in that it just takes in a single argument called X. The only difference comes when we add the guard here. So for the first one, when x is less than zero, we then want to invoke this clause. And then when x is greater than zero, we want to invoke this clause. With the case where we just get zero, we can just specifically say, all right, well, when test of zero, invoke this clause. So now if I compile the file that we just wrote and run these functions inside of IEX, you can see here that we do indeed get back the behavior that we want. So if I pass in positive 10, we get back positive. If I pass in negative 10, we get back negative. And if I pass in zero, then we will get back zero. At their core, these guards are just logical expressions that put further conditions on a clause. Now what happens if I call the test function with an atom inside of it? You can see here when I do that, we actually get back the positive return statement. Now the main reason why this works this way is because the greater than or equal to signs can be used to compare the different types inside of Elixir. Generally, when you're comparing between types, it will look a bit like this. So if you have a number and you compare it to an atom, the atom is always greater than the number, then the reference is always greater than the atom or the number, then the function is always greater than the reference, atom or number, and so on and so forth. And so when we call the test function with an atom in here, the atom is always going to satisfy this guard right here. So if I expand the two guards here, I can add a term that says when X is passed into test, it must be a number by calling this is number function. Is number will take in the value and it will return a Boolean whether or not the value is a number or a different type. And we have corresponding functions for all of the different types inside of Elixir as well. So now when I pass in the atom into the playground test function, you can see here that we get back a error as a result of it not fitting into any of our clauses. And of course, this would be the case with any non-number type that we pass to this function. Now when making up a guard for a clause of a function in Elixir, you can only use specific functions and specific operators. So when you're writing a condition, you can only use the double equals, the double not equals, the triple equals, the triple not equals, greater than, less than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. You can also use the Boolean operators and or or as well as the negation operators not or the exclamation point. You can use arithmetic operators plus minus multiply and divide and you can use type check functions 
from the kernel module, like the ones that we used up here. Now let's take a look at how we can write multi-clause lambda functions. So anonymous functions or lambdas may consist of multiple clauses. And if we just define a normal lambda, say double, we just say double fn, and then we define the function body, say x times two, and then we have an end statement to end the function. And then I can invoke the function by using the dot syntax like this. And then this will, of course, call the function that we just added to this variable double. So we can re-implement our test function as a lambda function using this format. So here we have our variable test and we're binding it to the lambda function fn and we're then defining the multiple different clauses. And the way that we define the clauses is by using a new line and saying the argument that we want to pass in here, in this case it's x, then we add the guard if we want to have one. So in this case we're saying x when is number x and x is less than zero. And then we've got this arrow which is just a dash and then a greater than sign. And the arrow allows us to basically separate each of the clauses. So this part is our first clause, this is our second clause, and this is our third clause. Now notice of course that the lambda clause doesn't have a special ending terminator. Instead, the clause just ends when a new clause is started or when the lambda definition is ended with the end keyword. Now, if we were to put this function into our IEX terminal, then it would work like our normal test function did before. All right, so now let's talk about conditionals. So Elixir provides some standard ways of doing conditional branching and these constructs are, for instance, the if construct and then the case construct. If you have a multi-clause function, then oftentimes you can rewrite it with some kind of conditional or you can do the opposite with a conditional and rewrite it as a multi-clause function. So here we have an example of the if and then the unless macros. The if macro is sort of like the opposite of the unless macro. So with the if statement, we're basically saying if this conditional comes back as true, do this, else do this. So we're just checking to see if A is greater than or equal to B, and if it is, then we'll return A, and if it's not, then we'll return B. On the other hand, we have unless. With unless, it's sort of like adding a negation to the front of the conditional. So we're saying here, unless A is greater than or equal to B, then return B, otherwise return A. In other words, if this returns true, then we go to the else branch, but if this returns false, then we go to the first branch. Now let's look at a way that we can chain a bunch of if else statements together using a macro called cond. Now this is fairly straightforward code except for the strange looking true arrow b part. The true pattern ensures that this condition will always be satisfied. And so essentially what we're doing here is saying, if this condition isn't satisfied, then immediately go to this branch and return B. If A is greater than or equal to B, then we return A. Then if it's not, then this automatically is true and therefore we'll return B. And of course we can run this function and it would give us back the expected behavior. Now say we want to rewrite this conditional function as a multi-clause function. We could do it like this using guards. So here we have for our first function, if we ignore this one, a function max that takes in two arguments and in the guard we check to see if a is greater than or equal to b and then it will return a. Then for our second clause we don't have a guard and we just return b. Now remember, when it comes to pattern matching against multi-clause functions, the order of the clauses does matter. So in this case, this function is checked first, and then if it doesn't satisfy the pattern, then this function is executed. We also have a general case statement, which is essentially just a pattern matching statement. 
So if we want to rewrite the max function using the case macro, with this function we're passing in two arguments, a and b, and then with the case statement we're checking to see what the result of this pattern is against the two cases down here. So we're checking to see if the pattern of a greater than or equal to b comes back with one of these cases. So if this pattern comes back as true, then we return A. And if it comes back as false, then we return B. Generally, you use the case construct when you don't want to define a separate multi-clause function. Though other than that, there are really no differences between case and writing a multi-clause function. In fact, the general case syntax can be directly translated into a multi-clause function. When using the case macro, like when using multi-clause functions, we can also write a catch-all case at the bottom of the case statement to catch any potential cases that would throw an error. The final branching construct that we'll discuss is the with special form, which can be very useful when you need to chain a couple expressions and return the error of the first expression that fails. Now suppose we need to essentially extract some data from a map that's being inputted into our application. So say we have a login map, and of course we have fields like login, email, and password, and we want to be able to extract them. So we've got these helper functions. Now also notice these are defined with def p, which means that they are private outside of this module. So if we were to try to call one of these functions inside of IEX after we've compiled this file, we wouldn't be able to call to the function. But these functions are fairly straightforward. We just check to see if in our map we have the key that we're looking for. So in this case, it's login, then email, then password. And if we do, we return a tuple of OK login. And if we don't, then we return an error and then login missing or email missing or password missing, etc. Of course, when dealing with a map like this, some required field might not be present in the input map. And in this case, we would want to report that error so that our function can have two different outcomes. We can either return the normalized user map or it can return an error. And the idiomatic approach to such a case is to make the function return OK, some result, or error, and then the error reason. Without the with branching construct, we would be delegated to running a bunch of case statements like this. And you can see that the function gets rather messy pretty quickly. So first we run a case on extract login, we pass in the user map, and if we get back an error, then we want to return that error with the reason. If we get back OK and then the login field, then we want to run extract email. And then we just keep doing this and we keep chaining up to password. And then finally we return our normalized map, which has login, email, and password in it. The with keyword can clean this up quite a bit. So let's take a look at what that would look like. With the with statement, we start at the top, evaluating the first expression and matching the result against the corresponding pattern. So in this case, we evaluate the extract login function, and then we want to get back OK and login. And if this matches, then we move on to the next line where we evaluate extract email from user and then we return OK email. And then if this matches, we move on to the next line yet again, evaluate extract password, and check to see if it matches this pattern. And then if it does match, we return this statement from our function. And so now our code is much cleaner and much smaller. And if any of these statements fails, then we'll get back the return statement from the failing clause of the private function. So if we call extract login and then the login key does not exist inside of the map, then we'll get back the error login missing. And so this kind of follows the idiomatic approach of returning error followed by the reason or returning OK followed by the solution. So now we can go ahead and define a map with the login, the email, and then the password inside of the map. And then if we go ahead and call playground, extract user, 
and we pass in our map, which is bound to X, you can see here that we get back, okay, email, some email, login, John, and then password, password. If I go ahead and remove the password from the map and then recall playground.extract user, you can see that we get back error, password missing, because the password is missing from the map. So the with clause is extremely useful for this type of cleanup. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, download it as much as you like. Have a good night.